And Elizabeth's here. How are you, Elizabeth, as well? Hi, Harry. First question, does fructose can cause glycation if it's not used as glucose in the bloodstream? Look, it's seven to, it depends. It depends on a lot of factors. If you're engaging the Randall cycle, it's going to be 10 times more glycating than glucose. If you're not engaging the Randall cycle, it's only going to be seven times more glycating. And then it depends on the quantity. You know, advanced glycation end products is basically when sugar molecules, um, I mean, obviously, if you overcook something and you actually cook the sugars, because remember, there's there's the glycerol backbone to, you know, to fats. So that part can actually be overcooked. So that's where from meat you can get advanced glycation in products. But you really, as remember, it's trace. You really have to overcook things to the to the hilt. Um, hopefully nobody does that. Um, but even if you did it, it's such small, it's minuscule in comparison. Let's say if that's the glycation in products effect from, from um, animal foods, from cooking, from sugar, r actual using actual sugar, you know, like tablespoons of sugar in your coffees and all that, it's going to be something like that. The order of magnitude is completely different. When they do those experiments on rats, they actually use high doses of this sort of stuff, this glycating factor from the animal food, which is completely unrealistic because, you know, the rat wouldn't eat so much. It would eat animal, the animal, if it had animal food like us, it would actually get very small trace amounts. Those trace amounts, your body can deal with them, even if you overcook your food. Even up to 32 hours. Remember the videos that I did? So don't really worry about it um, that much. But in terms of glycation from um, actual excess sugar, obviously if you engage the Randall cycle and you can't take in the sugar into the actual cells and it's floating around in the bloodstream and your blood sugar is going up, obviously you're filtering that blood through your kidneys, the nephrons will be glycated. That's what causes a lot of the kidney damage, you know? It's excess sugar, that it's not cleared out of the system. That's really what it is. Use it or it stays in the endothelium and attacks the endothelium and causes damage to the endothelium. And we know that sugar will actually collapse the pericellular, you know, the, um, you know those little pericellular matrix of the endothelium. Those, yep. Yeah. So those little glycans, they will actually just collapse. And when they collapse, they can collapse up to six hours. So you're going to basically cause endothelium problems and inflammation from engaging the Randall cycle, not clearing that sugar out of the system. So that's what it really is all about. It really depends on are we engaging the Randall cycle, are we not? How much quantity is it? How much of that is going to circulate through the blood and get filtered? How many times over and over within a day? How many times every two hours you're going to be stuffing down your, thro your throat um, more sugar? It's, you know, if you only do it once a day, you probably can, the body can probably manage that if you're doing it every two hours. You know, it all has to do with the, you know, the quantity of the poison, as they say, that it has the, the sort of the sort of effect. So yeah, it's yeah, it's really pretty much irrelevant in that regard. Yeah, you got you got to sometimes use when people make an argument. You got to go like people say, well, you know, God isn't carnival diet, you know, and they go, have you ever heard of the Inuit diet or the on the on the Maasai diet? You know, multiple generations eating animal foods and no only animal foods. So what are you implying? In those populations, was there any cardiovascular cancer or any of these diseases? No. So isn't that enough for you? The N15 data and all that? Do you need more? Or do we need some crackpots to adjust, you know, adjust the statistics in their studies and all that fabricated truths with epidemiology, you know, are we going to look at that sort of stuff or are we going to look at reality? It's like, for instance, 
I take a measurement from a pulsar. I go, mm, I don't really like that. What I'm, you know, I think the pulsar has been affected by some sort of nonsense that I came up with in my head. And I'm going to adjust the pulsar measurements. That's what they do with climate stuff. That's what they do with a nutrition. That's what they do with everything. They adjust things because they know best. They're the experts. This is the rationalist thinking. Remember, there are two paths in science, rationalism, and the other part is basically empiricism, people that are doing experimental to prove things and validate things over and over, and that is what, how they determine things, mechanisms, working out mechanisms, stuff like that. All the crackpots that basically just want to use statistical mumbo-jumbo adjustments in order to fabricate whatever. This is where a lot of this bullshit is coming from that you listen to or hear in academia or stuff like that. That's all it is, you know? You know, you've got to use your mind laterally and say, okay, you've got multiple generations, and when they go on the standard diet that we're doing, they get sick. Mm, I suspect their diet is better. And if you can't make that inference in your mind, you've got a problem of brainwashing that you need to overcome, pretty much. Anyway, let's move on.